Hi, and welcome to Answers News for Monday, September 17th, 2018. And Bodie is back. I'm so back. So he's back. Ken is still gone. He's, he's coming back soon, though, so he'll yep. be back this week. And he should be on air next week because yep. I know I won't be here one day. So well, my, somebody my, better be here. My son played his last baseball tournament this weekend. Oh, good. And uh, they, they took home the championship on that one, so good for them. They finished out the year with the championship. And oh, good. Um, yeah, so I was That's excited awesome. for him. They so did a good job. Now your life will slow down maybe just a little tiny bit. Well, maybe bit. a little <laughs> bit. We'll find <laughs> out. But. Yeah, so um, we would like to welcome our studio audience here. So go ahead and clap and make yourselves known. All right. All right. All right. And we are following this on um, the Answers in Genesis and Ken Ham Facebook page and YouTube as well. So I think we're not, there's only two of us, yeah, so we can only do so much. We're not that good. We're not going to follow all of them. But. <laughs> we're mainly on Facebook today, not on yeah. YouTube, but, uh, but, our, but the, it's airing on YouTube. So yeah. I have a couple of things just to share with you just by ways of reminder. Um, so every year, Answers in Genesis does a vacation Bible school, and mm -hmm. we've been doing this for almost 10 years now, I think. And so our 2019 theme is called The Incredible Race, One Family, One Race, One Savior. And so this focuses on the fact that we are all one race, descended from yep. Adam and Eve, just different people groups or ethnicities. Mm -hmm. And so if there was ever a time for this oh, yeah. BBS to teach our young people the truth about race, um, this is it. I'll tell you what, it really is. I mean, you know, we, and we have people say, well, why are there, there dark-skinned people or light-skinned people? It actually has to do with the melanin in mm -hmm. our skin. Some people have more melanin, some people have less melanin. It's the same sort of thing with the melanin in your eyes for right. blue eyes, green eyes, and dark eyes, and so forth. So yeah, we see the variation. It's a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. But uh, what we need to realize is there is one race, the human race, right. and that means we are all sinners, and we all need Jesus Christ no right. matter what we look like. So that's, that's, that's a powerful that, message in today's culture. It is, and so we, we need that. So you can find out more information on that if you're thinking about mm -hmm. BBS for next year. And then... Um, just a couple of months ago now, um, Answers in Genesis teamed up with Pure Flix. And yep. um, so you probably have heard of Pure Flix before, or maybe you already have the streaming service. And so what are, the deal is, is that basically you can get access to all of the Answers in Genesis DVDs on Pure Flix now. Um, and so you can find out more information on our yeah. website about how to sign up for that. And really the cost of it a month is less than the cost of one DVD. So it's very economical yeah, month, yeah. and um, they've got a lot of great media there. Um, and, and one of them, actually one of their movies um, aired just this weekend, um, Unbroken, The Path to Redemption. And so this is the story of Louis Zamperini and it is based on, a tr it is a true story. Um, he was an Olympic runner and a World War II soldier in POW. And if you saw the movie back in 2014, Unbroken, Angelina Jolie um, actually did that. And she kind of just did the first half of his life when he when mm -hmm. he was not a Christian. <laughs> and then this focuses on the second half of his life where he, he got saved. Yeah. And and I, I have not seen it yet, but I've only heard really good things about it. Yeah, good. And so we have a review on our website about the article. So you can look there and really encourage you to go out and support good Christian media like this, because yeah. there's a lot of stuff that is so bad. All there. right. We are, we are getting people here from California, Oregon, Texas. They're, they're kind of coming, New York here, coming from all over. Uh, shout out to Richard Smith. Your parents are in the audience, and they said, hey, give you a shout out. So yeah. um, there, there's probably because you, 20 because people you, out there named you Richard like Smith. You like him, we know. So. <laughs> but, yeah, so. yeah, we got people. Let's see. I got New York City on here. Uh, New York, California, Oregon, Texas. So I'm from of Georgia. Places. There we go. That's always is that, a good, is that a high to Georgia from Georgia? It's a great I, state to come from. So yeah, yeah. you know where, where's all those people from the Carolinas? <laughs> Well, they all left. Oh, right? we have some in the audience. Oh, we have so that's some. Good. All right. <laughs> They're fleeing, safe. Fleeing so. from the hurricane, which, that's a good which thing. is a reminder. We need to be praying yes, for the people do. down there and for yeah. what else happening. Uh, Hurricane Florence is, uh, mm -hmm. you know, hit, and uh, you know, there's a lot still, of damage. Uh, yeah. I know there are even some people that died. Uh, havoc. So, so be praying for the families mm -hmm. down there uh, uh, for recovery. And it's a massive system because we're even getting rain here yeah, today yeah, on just on the edge of it, and so it's just pretty amazing how big it is. So. Yeah. So, I, so if you go to the ark today. It's raining. Right. People, people are like, I want to go to the ark and see it raining. You know, so, ambiance yeah, included. So, yeah. all right. Well, let's get to our articles here. Um, the first one is gene editing fixes muscular dystrophy in dogs and humans could be next. So the headline's a little bit flashier than the actual information, but <laughs> yeah, they're as working always, on beagles, right? Uh, yeah. Some dogs. So they actually um, basically put a form of uh, muscular dystrophy in these dogs, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, a version of it. And they mm -hmm. used a gene editing technique called CRISPR. 
And you've probably heard about that in the news. And basically, CRISPR is really specific. So it can go in and remove a specific part of the DNA and replace it with the fixed version, OK? Uh, in this case, of the gene dystrophin. And so what they found, and it was extremely successful in these dogs, because they got 90% of the normal level of the dystrophin protein was, was restored to them. That's so, fascinating when, you, when you think about it. They were hoping for 15. Yeah. <laughs> so. 90% is definitely pretty good. Right. Um, and but, of course, there's still a lot more research to be done on this and, and what really can be done. But Right. Because um, we don't know if the protein, even though they're producing it, you have to show that the protein is actually functional in helping them overcome right. the dystrophy. And that still has to be That's shown. That's the key right there. So. That and CRISPR... Um, there's been some studies recently have been shown that CRISPR maybe isn't as specific as they'd like to think it is. So not only is it making that change that they wanted to make, but it may be making some other changes as well in the DNA, which is obviously a problems. bad thing, um, and we don't want. So, but it is, but it is great observational science that we can yeah. do these kinds of things and be able to help people in ways that we. That gene therapy has been around for years, but it hasn't really been that successful. And yeah. so this is another way of of looking maybe, at may, that. Maybe doing something. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's kind of curious, you know, here. These we beagles just, are like the lab rats of the dog world, I guess, right? <laughs> I guess. So. so, but it's good because they can help us understand more about these Excellent. diseases and how to treat that in people it is. because it is a terrible disease yeah. in people. So, yeah. All right. All right. On to cheese, all right? For ancient farmers, the road to Europe was paved with cheese. All right, so I was like, what? Um, so... <laughs> <laughs> you never know what you're going to find um, sometimes. But basically, this is about these um, clay pots that they discovered. And they're dating, they're dating to 72, uh, let me just say it, and then you can, you can do your thing okay. here. So they're dated to 7,200 years ago. And inside these clay pots, they found, they checked the residue, and they're finding evidence that cheese was at one point in these pots. Okay, so what's wrong with that? Okay, first off, there's a few things. 7,200 years ago is imaginary time. Uh, the date is clearly mm -hmm. wrong. If you look at this, farmers living near the Adriatic Sea, well, if, there, if there's people living there, this is a post-Babel event. Right. So it's occurred after that. fact is the Adriatic Sea was formed as a result of the flood of Noah's day. So, I mean, this is clearly post-flood, post-Babel. So, you know, we're looking at something probably less than 4,400 40, years yeah, ago. at the most. Um, mm -hmm. or, or even less than that. So, you know, it frustrates me when I see these dates because the world throw these, throw these out there mm -hmm. all the time. It's like, well, you know what? I, I would love to see these things calibrated and corrected, to, you know, to biblical dates. But there's a lot of assumptions behind the radiometric dating methods, and that's just one of right. them. And, and it shows, too, that, mm -hmm. I mean, ancient people were making these things and doing these they things. They were smart. That, yeah, they right. were Right, they weren't, they weren't stupid. They knew how yeah. to do these things. Genesis 4 gives us plenty of evidence of that, where mm -hmm. they were making instruments, they were forging metal, and that was before the flood. Um, so they knew how to do these kinds of things, and they've yeah. been doing that for a long period of time. Well, they're making the argument here that the Balkan Peninsula is considered to be the gateway for the spread of farming into Northern Europe, and I just think that's a cheesy argument. Uh. So he is the, he is yeah, the okay. yeah, chief but, of puns. Hey, here's the thing. As people left Babel, they took certain technologies with them mm -hmm. to different parts sure. of the world. Uh, you know, we, we have records of uh, Gomer, one of uh, Noah's grandsons, and his great-grandson Ashkenaz making it into, into Central and Northern Europe and some of those places very soon after Babel. So people were up there. They were farming right. and that sort of thing. So you have to be very careful. Be discerning when you read articles like mm -hmm. this. So. And it's amazing what we can find out just by looking at the stuff left over in people's pots. I mean, you know, we don't think about that maybe <laughs> when we wash our dishes and I don't and know. Everything. I go to Goodwill and I see a pot. I'm like, you know what? I still see some residue in some of the... <laughs> so they... Uh, what they're saying is we shouldn't wa be so quick. I guess they normally wash it out mm -hmm. before they take it back to the lab and study it and everything, right. or when they do. But well, they yeah, said, they out of don't the wash it. <laughs> right. Leave it because and, you know there's, there, there's whole fields of study. You know, looking at the residue. You know, at the mm -hmm. bottom of different vats and things right. like that. You know, I'm familiar with uh, Dr. Patrick McGovern. You know, he's he's kind of an expert in some of this bio molecular uh, archaeology. <laughs> And uh, one of the things that they'll do is they'll go in and see, you know, mm -hmm. what kind of residue is at the bottom of certain pots. And he specializes in ancient meads and ales and things like that, right. and ancient wines and stuff like that, based on the residuals. Mm -hmm. Now, it wouldn't surprise me, you know, if they find different fats. And I don't know how well they clean them before they did the next thing. You might find residual from several yeah. different things sometimes. But uh, it is, it's a fascinating study. Yeah, they've right. even found cheese. Um, yellow hunks of preserved cheese, so it's actually still there. Yeah, Wrapped yeah. around the necks of 3,800-year-old mummies in China. Apparently, it was a snack for the afterlife, okay? so And they never ate it. I mean, what they was They never ate it. Imagine that. That is a sign how permanent uh, 
death is. I think stats are about one out of every one of us are going to die at some point in our lives. Yeah, but, uh, that's very true. Somebody, uh, this is a joke. Somebody said, all this time I thought CRISPR was just part of, the, of my refrigerator where I stored vegetables. It sure Not is. Not that kind of CRISPR, sure okay? Is. This is spelled a you little bit differently. You can find DNA in there too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Adaptable lizards illustrate key evolutionary process proposed a century ago. They, no, they don't. They illustrate a key adapt, adaptation <laughs> um, mm -hmm. that was maybe proposed a century ago. It has nothing to do with evolution because evolution is you're going from one kind of organism to a completely different kind of organism. Mm -hmm. These lizards are still lizards. They're just different colors of lizards. Okay, so it's lizards changing into lizards. That's right. It's amazing. Wow, I'm just, you know, that blows yeah. me away. That, yeah. that should be a front page this, article This somewhere. isn't even getting, I mean, how is this getting it to be something that's not a lizard? That's what I'm saying, it's not it's evolution. Not. Variation in, in something like that, that's not a big deal. I mean, mm -hmm. that, you know, we just pointed that out, you know, when it comes to the one human race. Yeah, we have variation right. in our, our own skin tones even. Mm -hmm. You know, and they look at this and say, look, evolution. No, those are, those are lizards. Yeah. Yeah. The lizards changing into lizards. Yes, you see yeah. variation. Not a big right. deal, really. And it's just, and it's really interesting because the, the darker lizards are the ones that live where there tend to be volcanic eruptions and lots mm -hmm. of black lava rocks. Okay, so of course they're darker than the ones that don't live in those areas. And so what they're trying to determine is um, how that has happened over time. Okay, and so one of the things they discovered is if you take one of the green lizards and you put it in an area where it is darker, mm -hmm. like within a month, those lizards are darker. Now, that is not a genetic change, like a change in the sequence of the DNA, but it's what we call an, probably, an, probably they don't know for sure, but it's probably an epigenetic change, which means um, it's, it's, epigenetics means on top of the DNA. So it's affecting something from the environment, could be mm -hmm. affecting the expression of their DNA, such as these lizards are now darker than, than they used to be. Right, and that's, so that's, not, a that's temporary not part of the, the overall DNA that would get passed right. along from, from father to son right. or mother to, to daughter, that sort of thing. So they did look at it from, from a sequence perspective, and they said, well, the, the green ones, so to speak, have different variants than, uh, in their DNA than the ones that are darker and blacker. Okay, so they're like, well, 22,000 years ago, you know, this happened. No, you know, that's just based on assumptions, okay? Yeah. So it could be that the, these variations were in the population as a whole, that God designed them that way, and then when they went to various areas, the, of course, the ones that are darker are going to survive better on the lava right. in that area than the ones that are green. So you just get an increase in that population there versus the ones that are in population yeah. without or an area without the lava rocks. Yeah. Okay, so I'm seeing people from Illinois, Oklahoma, Wyoming, Michigan. Um, one person makes a comment on here. I've got to read this. I always wondered what the wife of the man who discovered cow's milk was thinking when he came home and told his wife, guess, guess where I got this milk from? <laughs> You know, well, I don't know. Let's go make some cheese out of it. I don't know. Yeah. I <laughs> but, don't know. you know, that is one of those fascinating things. Or maybe it was the wife that discovered it and had to go tell the oh, husband. Oh, yeah. Who knows? <laughs> so, so anyway, so this isn't what we try to help people understand. God made, God created organisms with the ability mm -hmm. to adapt and the ability to uh, diversify within their kind. But it's not evolution, right. period. Yeah, so. that's the key. That's okay. the key looking at that. Oldest known drawing found on tiny rock in South mm -hmm. Africa. So... There it is. Pretty fascinating. I looked Looks at like that and went, what? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I would have picked that out as a drawing of any kind. It does, I don't know. That's just My personal. kids do better than that. Come on. Yeah. Well, they said it kind of oh. looks like an ancient hashtag. And I'm like, oh, so even the ancients were into social media and hashtagging <laughs> things, I guess. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah. I don't know. They, but they're saying this drawing is 73,000 years old. <clears throat> There we Imaginary go. Imaginary time, there it is. Mental yep. buzzer goes off. Yep. And they say, and from these scratch marks, now it's amazing, it's amazing what they can tell you from a few marks from an ochre crayon, okay? They said it's a prime indicator of modern cognition because this is, the lines on the stone mark are the first abstract drawing. I'm like, okay, uh, so, so okay. they see that and they, they automatically go, wow, there was an incredible intelligence behind this. But then they look at a DNA, yep. which is incredibly intricate code system. Way more and they than say, that. oh no, accident, random chance. Yeah. See, there's a. That's the what I'm saying. You see the inconsistencies that in yes, that. I mean, me we look at a few scratches on a rock and say, ooh, they were really mm. smart, right? Yep. And we look at DNA and say, no. Nope. 
random yep. chance over eons of Once time. Once again, this is post-flood, post-battle, you know, if it is, uh, you know, actual markings from somebody drawing things out. But uh, yeah. Ken, uh, quit texting us during Answers News, yeah, okay? Yeah, he should know. I, <laughs> I'm literally getting texts. And he's texting us news <laughs> items. Look at the stuff we do. He's sending with. us articles for more Answers <laughs> News programs. So, yes. oh my goodness. All okay. Right. Oh, somebody said on here, this is the cheese recipe. So, there we have it. Yeah, that, yeah. that's right. That's the cheese recipe. <laughs> The lady that first uh, discovered the milk from the cow. Oh, boy, this is... <laughs> All right. A thousand-year-old medieval map reveals location of Noah's Ark and other biblical mysteries. All right. I'm going to let you... you he, he's into archaeology and maps and all that stuff, yeah, so I'm like going to let him take this one away. Yeah, this is the Hereford map. It's Believe it or not, I mean, you know, I saw this come out in the news. You know, it's a September 10th, 2018, and mm -hmm. people find out about it. They get excited, and they write news articles on it. But <laughs> believe it or not, this map has been around. People have known right. about it. Well, I mean, for a thousand years, people mm -hmm. have known about it. Uh, because it goes back, it was actually in a cathedral, uh, just up there. There's an hmm. immense amount of information on it. And uh, yeah, it's got a, a spot, you know, for where Noah's Ark was. It's got a spot for the Tower of Babel. And they even put a Garden of Eden in there. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if you kind of look down there. Toward, oh, there's yeah, the there, Ark. There it is. So you it's can circled on it. this one. Yeah, there it is. You can kind of see it up there. Right in the middle is Jerusalem, just to kind of give you an idea where they're at. Mm -hmm. Well, I actually did a book. Uh, with Laura Welch, uh, The Flood of Evidence. And actually, it was Laura that had discovered this map before I had ever seen it. And we actually have it featured in here. It's one of the many maps. There's actually a number of different ancient maps yeah. that uh, have, uh, uh, you know, Noah's Ark or different things listed mm -hmm. on it. And I thought, well, that's kind of fascinating. This book is called uh, Flood of Noah. It's got some fascinating flips and things like that. And it's a great family book, by the way. But uh, we have a number of different maps. Uh, the Salter World map, uh, Ranolf. Uh, there's some, sometimes I can't even pronounce them, you know, but it is fascinating <laughs> I can't. and they'll put it on there. Now where they place it is in the general vicinity of the mountains of Ararat. Mm -hmm. uh, you might think of where modern Mount Ararat is. Now the Bible never said that the ark came to rest on Mount Ararat. Right. It said the mountains right. of Ararat, mountains which is a range, mm -hmm. Eastern Turkey, Western Iran, right in there. So it is kind of in the right vicinity. And I know people do argue over what mountain did it land on. Mm -hmm. A lot of people suggest uh, Mount Ararat, but Mount Ararat is a gigantic volcano. Its last eruption was in the 1840s. Right. So we're pretty familiar with a number of its eruptions over the years. So if it was there, it's either buried or burnt up. You know, I right. doubt it would be sitting sure. on top of it. I know there's some debate over all that. Uh, one of the, uh, the other mountains in the same general vicinity is called Mount Judy or Mount Cootie. Uh, and uh, it's a little bit lower than Mount mm -hmm. Ararat. Modern day Mount Ararat is over 17,000 feet high. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's a gigantic mm -hmm. mountain. Mm -hmm. But uh, this other one's about 6,000 feet high. A lot of ancient literature actually pointed to that mountain. Now, is yeah. that the site? We don't know. Yeah, we just um, don't know. Uh, I did an article in uh, How Do We Know the Bible's True Volume 2 that looks at uh, the different arguments and the different places people have suggested for uh, trying to find right. Noah's Ark. So. Yeah, and they also show the Garden of Eden on here, mm -hmm. which is kind of interesting because um, in a, yep, a post-flood world, there is no Garden of Eden. It was wiped out um, by the flood. So That's right, we need to think there big shouldn't picture. be on there. <laughs> Noah's <laughs> flood obliterated things, rearranged things, right. and so forth. But there's a good reason that people sometimes make this mistake. In fact, a lot of people today mm -hmm. make this mistake. They say, oh, yeah, it's got to be over here by the Tigris and Euphrates River over in places like Iraq mm -hmm. because you see the mm -hmm. Tigris and Euphrates rivers and they're mentioned right there in Genesis chapter 2. Now here's the problem. If you actually look at the geology carefully, it's different. Uh, back in Genesis 2, you have one river that splits into four. And one of the rivers uh, goes in a particular direction which doesn't match up with what we see today. It makes more sense that as Noah and his family come off the ark, they brought some of those names forward with right. them and they renamed certain rivers. We tend to do that all the time. For example, uh, the Thames River, it's in England, flows down, London's right there. Mm -hmm. Well, if you come over here to the States, you go to Connecticut, there's also a Thames River. Right. And uh, there's New London right off of that one. You go up to Ontario, Canada, there's a Thames River there, and it's right yeah. off of London. You see, people brought the names over. Sure. So you have to, you have to think in terms of fourth dimension. You've got to think mm -hmm. in terms of time, what has happened the flood uh, destroyed all that, laid down flood sediment, and they've renamed a couple but of But it's kind of cool to see this map. It's a thousand years old. Um, that's what they're dating it to. So mm -hmm. obviously, they took these events as real history <laughs> and yeah. real things that happened yeah. um, enough to put them on a map. Yeah, that's fascinating, though. Yep. So. All right, I got people on here from Texas, Oklahoma, Wisconsin, Oregon, Wyoming. Um, man, we're going to have all 50 mm -hmm. states here. Alaska. I even got Alaska. Someone says there's a so. Paris in Texas. 
There's a Paris and Illinois too. Yeah. Well, yeah. we have lots in um, Indiana. We have a lot of Cairo. Italian ones. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we have a Cairo, yeah. not a Cairo, a Cairo in Illinois, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, where I, the south of where I grew up from. Okay, a new chapter, a fresh approach. Um, this is about the new president of the American atheist, Nick Fish. Um, it says, brings a lifetime of commitment to equality. So a lot of the article focuses on he wants equality for, and he's meaning for the atheists, that, you know, they, they're mm -hmm. underserved, they're underrepresented, you know, all of that, and he yeah. wants to have equality. And I thought, why? Because well, actually, in his worldview, yeah. there's no basis for yeah. everything being But equal. let me give the audience a little background to what's happened here. Uh, the chapter of the American Atheists, their president uh, was, uh, well, he got in a lot of trouble with some, yep. some sexual issues and uh, was let go, essentially. Mm -hmm. He was uh, pretty much canned. And so they've been looking for a new president for the American Atheists. And this, uh, Nick Fish is who they've uh, brought in to be the new president. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that, you know, this has officially been announced and, you know, they basically have an article on him. You know, well, what's he looking for? What's his right. goals what's and he, things like yeah. that? You know, he wants to fight to advance equality under the law for all Americans. Right. But will he? Would he fight for Christians and their rights? Nope. No, he probably wouldn't. He would probably argue for the religion of atheism. Um, so those are the things we need to be discerning about when you see. Right, because he doesn't uh, really, I mean, like he this. would never say that atheism is a religion. He talks about religion all throughout this article, but almost every time you see it, you should, what he's really saying is Christianity. Mm -hmm. That's what he's against. Right. He's not against religion because he, he is part of a religion, the religion of atheism. What he's really against is Christianity. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm always fascinated by the fact that an atheistic worldview, atheists, they're absolutely opposed to a creative God or that right. we are created in God's image to mm -hmm. be creative and so forth. And yet it says in here that, uh, Nick, he is a tireless advocate who is creative. <laughs> I thought that was quite interesting yeah. that, that they would use that terminology here. But. And, and they, he talks about how he wants um, the atheists to be more involved in things like charity work and social justice mm -hmm. because basically other religious, or, because religious organizations, which he really means for the most part Christians, Christians have been yeah. doing this, and atheists should be more involved in that. And I was like, why? Because see, from a Christian worldview, you have a basis for that because the Bible, and Jesus right. makes it clear, we are to help people, the widows, the orphans, those that are sick, those that are in prison. We have a foundation for doing that. But from an atheistic standpoint, your worldview is evolutionary. It's survival of the fittest. It's right. dog eat dog. Why would you help other people? I mean, they're unfit. If they're sick, let them die. Right. I mean, you don't want them to continue on and pass their genes on. Why not have on. abortion? Why not have euthanasia? And, yeah, uh, we're all just know, animals like anyway, so why not act like one? Right. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Right. They yeah, just really it really can't doesn't. Be. You know, uh, you know just, just think of a materialistic worldview like atheism. We're all just atoms reacting with each other. You know, do, do atoms run around saying, oh, I want to be equal? You know, do, yeah. does hydrogen say, I want to be equal to boron <laughs> right. or carbon or what? No, I mean, you got to think there's an inconsistency going on here. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm happy when they help out, you know, people who are starving or provide shelter and things like that. It's very Christian of them, to yeah, be honest. Yeah, it is. But yeah, from an atheistic borrowing. perspective, they're borrowing mm -hmm. that from a Christian They're borrowing worldview. from a biblical yeah. worldview. So that's but, what uh, we need to see. Yeah, and you know what? Uh, uh, an appeal to Christians out there, be, be praying for him. Yeah. Be praying for him. We need to. So, okay. Um, let them not share in the affairs of life. How ancient Christian re Christians were viewed as dangerous to society. So this is kind oh, of those a dangerous Christians. <laughs> yeah, this is kind of a look back yeah. at the second century. Okay, so we're talking the 100s. So not yeah. too long after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Right, and the apostles had pretty much died. And... Right. Yeah. yeah. And there was one person in particular that this author shares about, and that is Celsus. And he was a, a very anti-Christian person. And he was saying why he felt the Christians were, well, first of all, he thinks they're, um, they're not very intellectual, that they're stupid. Um, and then he says, well, also he doesn't like them because they don't, they don't participate in the things of Roman culture and Roman life. Um, because he says job number one for any Roman citizen was the corporate public worship of the gods, right? Right, including the emperor. The emperor was basically lumped right. in with the gods. Yeah. Now, it's interesting, you know, I was involved in a world religions and cults book series, mm -hmm. and uh, one of the things we looked at is things like Roman 
uh, mythology. There's Greek mythology. They parallel each other in a lot of instances. They're just pagan religions. And really, they were forms of ancestor worship. You know, you look back at some of these Greeks. Who were they? Actually, you can find some of their, their ancient names were some of the names you'd find mm -hmm. as uh, some of the early people after the Tower of Babel and so forth. And, uh, you, know, I've always, you know, I've always been fascinated by that. But that's what that is. It's a form of ancestor worship. They're worshiping the ancestors, and they're trying to make Christians worship right. some of these ancestors. And Christians step back and say, no, we want to worship God and only God, the God who right. created all things. It's not that they didn't have respect for their ancestors or different people's right. ancestors, but you got to be careful of that type of worship. But they saw that as being divisive to their mm -hmm. society um, and to what they were trying to accomplish in, in Roman in Roman society. Mm -hmm. And so what, what Celsus basically concludes is that he wants the race, meaning the Christian race, mm -hmm. to become extinct from the face of the earth. Yeah, I mean, he, he should very be much completely wiped out. Kind of, kind of resembles Hitler with regards to the Jews and the Christians and, mm -hmm. and the Poles and the Slavs and a lot of others, you know, back in his time. Yeah. And, uh, you, know, it was, I, you know, I see stuff like that. And, and, and one of the things that I saw in here in particular, mm -hmm. Celsus viewed Christians as ignorant, uneducated, and simpletons. Right. Now, I, I thought, hold on, let's contrast this. You know, you go to the New Testament. Paul mm -hmm. actually made a statement. He's like, uh, we're the debaters of this age. Right. You know, ha hasn't God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Mm -hmm. Paul had obliterated the uh, different debaters out there. He was at Mars Hill and just did an incredible job. He just, he, he refuted people so well. And, and yet, he was like, where's the debaters? Where, where are they right. at? We've lost... And now they're turning around saying Christians were the simpletons. I think he just didn't understand what Christianity was right. and hadn't come up against someone who was pretty familiar with it. Right. We need to understand, and the reason that I kind of chose this article was because um, nothing has changed. <laughs> I mean, this was going yeah. back, this is going back to the second century. Mm -hmm. Here we are, you know, mm -hmm. now, and the same things are happening. And, and one of the things he says is that, you know, the culture always demands that Christians do this publicly. Everyone has to compare. Form, right? It's not enough just to say, like, you can't yeah. even say you disagree. You have to agree with it. It's right. not enough just to tolerate it. You have to embrace it. Right. They wanted, they wanted Christians to be forced to worship their gods. They also right. wanted them to be involved in orgies and worshiping wood and all this other stuff. I mean, we read a lot of that stuff in the New Testament, and Christians oppose that sort of thing. Right. But they, they also criticize Christians for wanting to step back from that and say, mm -hmm. well, you know what? We're not going to be part of this. Let's go have our own meetings and let's go right. uh, talk about Christ, learn about him. And, you know, so they were like, oh, well, what are these guys doing at their secret meetings? It's mm -hmm. all suspicious and yeah. that sort of thing. It's like, well, consider what would happen if they went out in the public and said, we absolutely oppose you and that sort of thing. You know what they did to Christians then? They tortured them. Yeah. They, burned they them alive. behead them, burnt yeah. them alive, threw them in the Colosseum, had, had to be eaten by lions. Yeah, there's a good reason for them backing off just a little bit. You know, do you have to be in, in you know, the Bible says to always be prepared to give an answer, but it doesn't say always give it. Yeah. There's a time to step back and mm -hmm. there's a time to regroup and, and yeah. learn more about the Lord and uh, uh, love on him. And there's a time yeah. to uh, go forward and, and do the public debate and so forth. Mm -hmm. Well, he, he said it's ironic, really. In a culture that claims so claims to value tolerance, Christians who refuse to publicly affirm their cultural gods are given none. Yeah. So they're totally intolerant of our intolerance, basically. Yeah. Well, you know, we still see Christian persecution today. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in the past 10 years, Christians have been the most mm -hmm. persecuted group in the right. world. Uh, they estimate about 100,000 Christians are killed, what was it, per decade, I think right, is what yeah. they said. And, uh, you know, that doesn't just count all the other persecution as well. And we're seeing well, more and more of that in this country even. And, and what he ended with, and I really appreciated this, it says, we will not be accepted as citizens of this earthly kingdom. But that is a reason to be even more th thankful that Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world, right? Th we're just travelers here. We're foreigners. Um, this is not the kingdom of, uh, that we're going to eventually be. That's right. When of. we die, we're not taking cheese with us. You don't no. need to put that in our <laughs> graves. Nope, we don't need that. Okay. Students ordered to spray paint over name of Christ on football fields. So this happened down in mm -hmm. Louisiana, um, and it was a logo, a logo for a, a Christian business called Christ Fit Gym, and um, they had a faith-based gymnasium. And so you can see there, um, that was their. They paid thirty-five hundred dollars to have this on the field to, you know, show their business and everything. Mm -hmm. And they, the foot, some of the football players or high school students were told to go paint over it because someone had complained because it had a Bible verse on it and had the word Christ on it. Hmm. So, you know, if there was an atheistic one up there, would it be, you know, would the same people have went out yeah. and said, hey, you can't do this? Yeah, no. 
Yeah. You see, I mean, there's a that. double standard on, on all this. Yeah. And I mean, what, what would happen if there's a girl at the school named Christian? You know, oh, sorry, we don't accept your identification. We need to spray paint that. Yeah. You know I mean, how embarrassing is this? I know. I mean, uh, that, and it just shows mm -hmm. you the limit and this, that these, the mm -hmm. extent to which these people are willing to go to. And um, so what's good is, though, the owner of this business said, uh-uh, this isn't how, I mean, they did paint over it, actually. But mm -hmm. he said, I'm not taking this. Like, this is yeah. my right to, you know, I paid for this. This is the logo for my mm -hmm. place of business. It should be allowed to be displayed. And so, uh, like I, I said over yeah. and over again, we have to fight for our rights or they will be taken away. Yeah. And so I'm thankful that he's um, doing that. So uh, yeah. we got time. We got time for another one. Let's go ahead and do another more. one. All We're right. Jump over to India. India's top court decriminalizes gay sex and landmark ruling. So um, this was a law on the books um, since the colonial times, basically, since um, Britain, you know, first came in and took over India or, or claimed India. Yeah, about India. 150 years it's been on yeah. the books. Yeah. And so they said it's an archaic law, okay, that was um, against the order of nature. Um, yeah. it, 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 it was basically a pro marriage. Right. Uh, you know, it was in opposition to <laughs> sexual immorality. Right. Uh, but, you know, they've, they've overturned that now, and uh, they want to increase sexual immorality, basically, right. in India. And, really and what this is saying. what we're seeing in so many countries now. It's happening in Ireland. It's happened in Australia. It's happening here. Mm -hmm. It's happened there. Um, and, uh, and now what they want to do is it's not just enough that they decriminalize um, gay sex. Now mm -hmm. they said, well, now we want to have Ma ma yeah. gay marriage and now we want to have all these other things. We want right. society to be accepting of right. us and of them. And one of the things that stuck, struck mm -hmm. out to me was one of the people involved in this said, we have to go and talk to people and change their mindset so that they accept every human as one. And I thought, well, I would agree that we're one race, we're the human race. Right. And we've talked about that a little bit today, but we're not one in the sense of of our spiritual races. There's mm -hmm. two. There's, you're either Christian or you're or not. You're not. <laughs> yeah. um, those are the only two real possibilities. And you know, I, I can see people being really confused in India over this issue because, you know, Hinduism dominates there. And for those right. of you who are familiar with Eastern religions, basically they teach that all is one. You are me, I am you, and vice versa, mm -hmm. and all this sort of stuff. It's called the doctrine of Maya. Mm -hmm. Now, they don't live this way. I mean, you, you walk up to somebody who says, you know, that they're professing... Uh, uh, Hinduism, you know, by rights, well, give me your wallet then. You know, if I'm you, give me your, give me your money. Uh, they, they won't do that, though. You right. see, they don't live consistently right. within that religion. Right. But here they are saying, oh, all is one. We're all together in this and, and this and that. It's like, well, no, you got to be careful on some of that kind of stuff because, I mean, this is sin. Yeah. He, well, what it is, they've got a false worldview underneath that. Mm -hmm. And what that says to me is an evolutionary worldview, this uh, uh, homosexual agenda and so forth, it's not just being imposed in our country. Mm -hmm. It's being imposed in other countries, even under other religions. Right. Um, and I thought, well, that's fascinating how he's just starting to dominate that because mm -hmm. this is a minority. This is yeah. not a majority. Oh, this yeah. is a oh, yeah. very small minority now mm -hmm. controlled that's, uh, yeah. the, the laws in India. Now. Right, yeah. All right. Well, that's all we have time for today. Um, somebody on here said, love your show. So um, we enjoy doing it. So we're glad you could join <laughs> us um, today. And we'll be back on Thursday. It'll be me, you, and I think it's either Tommy or Brian. I can't Somebody's going to be back Somebody, with us, somebody yeah. else will be here Probably with us. Third every, person. Right. Yeah. Everyone else was traveling today. I think it's Tommy. Dr. Tommy Mitchell will be yeah. back here with us. So anyway, right. so we'll, well sign off for today. All. We'll see you then. Mm -hmm.